will start uh, where we left off uh, the last day. We were discussing uh, the implication of kinetics, right, on in protein folding. So the topic we are going to start off with today is uh, known as phi value analysis. Now you will see it is an exquisite way of trying to determine how the transition state is affected because the only way the transition state can be probed is by kinetics right there's in protein folding at least it's very hard otherwise to figure out what's happening in the transition state so what is this phi value analysis so I'll go in more detail uh, let's look at this uh, formula first so what it says is phi unfolding that means you are unfolding a protein you are starting from the folded state you are going to the unfolded state what is it equal to it is equal to delta delta g dagger minus f that means because you are going from the folded state to the unfolded state right it is phi unfolding right hence the difference between the transition state and the folded state is the one which is your energetic barrier and you are considering a delta delta why it is a delta delta remember it is a delta delta because if you are taking just one protein which is the wild type then it is delta g dagger minus f but now you are comparing two proteins what are the two proteins in one protein is a wild type that means you have not made any changes in the amino acid sequence in the other protein what you have done is you have made a mutation and hence the difference between these two delta g's is referred to as delta delta g okay so the top one is the one which is related to the transition state as you can understand what is the bottom one the bottom one is the one which is related to what tell me in the simplest term it is related to an equilibrium term so it is essentially the difference between the unfolded and the folded state between the two proteins one being the wild type the other one being the mutant and to make it a little more clear for you this is how it goes so that means phi unfolding is equal to the change in the barrier minus the change in the folded state which is in the top one the numerator and the denominator essentially is delta g u minus delta g f okay again this one comes from equilibrium thermodynamics and this one we get from kinetics okay see the bottom one we have already referred to before we can always have equilibrium free energy changes for proteins remember all those transitions we talked about before right that is easy to, for us to have but for having the same information with respect to the transition state we got to go through kinetics now why we are going through all this or why was this idea developed now this is why it was developed remember we started this when we talked about when we well before actually coming to this the topic we started on is or was rather the nucleation condensation model wasn't it? it was a nucleation condensation model and if you would try to figure out if you try to figure out which amino acid which amino acid is being involved in the transition state towards the final structure formation this is something you would be doing again okay. what it means is what you are trying to figure out now is if the protein has 150 amino acids right not all amino acid would equally affect the folding of the protein instead what you would do is say a protein forms a hydrophobic core right which is the interior of the protein and you would know for the protein to be stable the hydrophobic core the interactions have to be pretty well developed if that is so then what it would also tell you is that those amino acids in the hydrophobic co core would be 
one of the key components for the protein to remain folded, right? If that is so, what you would do is you would try to target one of those amino acids, replace it with another mutant and see to what extent it is affecting your folding or unfolding. That is essentially what you will be doing, okay? And that is essentially what you are trying to figure out. And to end this part of the discussion, this tells you the residue level. It is like a residue level interrogation of how a protein folds. That means you pick amino acid by amino acid, you change that amino acid with another amino acid. I will tell you under what conditions or what are the approximations you can do or what changes you can do. If you would change this amino acid with another one, then you would absolutely be able to figure out to what extent this amino acid was being involved in the folding unfolding pathway. And this way you can pick out a lot of amino acids. That is essentially what you want to do. Because getting residue level information in proteins, especially for a two state folding protein, where there are only two states, folded and unfolded, is very hard. Is it clear? So again, we have to get residue level information. Now, let me uh, just take you back to something you would know. Remember, if you would try to figure out whether that hydrogen is involved in a certain reaction, right? whether that bond involving the hydrogen is involved in a certain reaction, what would you do? You would replace it by deuterium. Remember this primary kinetic isotope effect, secondary kinetic isotope effect? What are you trying to do? You are trying to figure out whether that bond is actually involved in the reaction and then to what extent is it involved. right? Exactly the same thing you are doing here, right? Instead of a bond, what are you replacing? You are replacing an amino acid. Okay? That is essentially what it is in a nutshell. Okay? Then what is your strategy? Your strategy is this. The first one is you have to make mutants in such regions of the protein that contribute to the stability. Now it makes sense, right? If you take a certain mutant which has very little effect on the stability of the protein, you are not going to get much information because you know finally the final structure of the protein or the native structure of the protein is not exactly determined by that amino acid. Hence the change whatever you would be getting would be either very small or insignificant. So you would have to by logical choice look at a certain region of the protein which is inherently involved or intrinsically involved or very importantly involved in terms of its interactions and with its neighbors and all these things. So you pick out the hydrophobic core, you know, that is one of the things which we always do. Okay? Then now each mutant is used as a structural probe during folding and unfolding of the protein, that is what I said. That means if you would be doing the kinetics, I will show you later, you can look at, you can look at the folding arm or the unfolding arm and you would be able to figure out to what extent this amino acid is affecting this arm or that arm. Okay? Now wait for that one. Now what you would do is, you would do kinetic measurements, right? You would do kinetic measurements on both the wild type and the mutant. So remember, if you go back to the phi f, the phi unfolding rather. So phi unfolding was equal to what? Delta delta g hash minus f, right? So that means, if you would do kinetic measurements on the two mutants, what you would you get? You would get this numerator. The denominator is coming from what? Equilibrium measurements. For that, you do not have to do kinetics because that is essentially equilibrium and hence you compare those. So then that is what the last statement says, the above is correlated with the change in the equilibrium free energy of unfolding because I am talking about phi unfolding. Parallelly, I can also talk about the reverse process that is phi folding. Here I am starting from the unfolded state going to the, sorry, the folded state going to the unfolded state. I can also start from the unfolded state and go to the folded state. Either way, no problem at all. Okay. So, let us look at a free energy diagram, right? And let us try to keep it very simple. We are talking about a two state protein, right? So, let this be the wild type. Say this is the folded state because you are talking about unfolding. So, you start from the folded, go to the unfolded. So, this is the transition state, right? And say this is your unfolded state. Okay? So, wherever you have these solid lines, this one belongs to the wild type. That means, you have not done any changes in the protein whatsoever. It is how it is found in nature, that is it. 
So, if I just join these, say this one right. So, this is the transition state of the wild type. Now, what you do is you do a certain mutation, right, and say yeah, something like this happens. Now, this is just a profile of what changes we are going to look at, okay. So, all the dotted lines are your mutant, okay, all the dotted lines are your mutant. So, here also I will be having a similar thing. Okay. This is my free energy, this is my free energy in the y axis and the x axis have a certain reaction coordinate. It does not matter what it is. Okay. Now, what is this one? So, from here to here, from here to here, what is this one? If this is a transition state, right. So, this is the transition state for the wild type, this is a transition state for the mutant. So, then this one I can write as G dagger minus G F. Okay, good. Now, if this is the mutant for me, right? So that this dotted line is a mutant. So then, for the dotted line, I can write. This is what is G prime. The prime refers to the mutant minus G. This is F. Is this clear? So, one is the free energy difference between the transition state and the folate state of the protein in the wild type, which is G hash minus G F. The other one is for the mutant, which you see on the left hand side. Okay. So, now because you see the folate state has also moved and the unfolded state has also moved with respect to the wild type for the mutant, this one I can say this is delta G. Okay, and this one I can say it is delta G U. Right? Can you tell me what this one would be now? This difference between these two? What should I write? So this one is delta delta g isn't it right because i am going from the folded state to the unfolded state i am looking at unfolding so the idea of this figure is just look at what this figure is trying to tell you or portray to you is essentially these things what are the thermodynamic parameters that are involved in this actual transition so that means if the mutant is changing my folded and unfolded state, then the change for the folded state would be given by delta G f, the change for the unfolded state is given by delta G u, G hash minus G f is the T s barrier, G hash minus G f with the primes is the same barrier for the mutant. So, if I take a difference between these two barriers, I will be getting delta delta G, that means the difference in barriers of the two transition states, which is delta delta G hash f. Okay. Is it clear what we are talking about now? So, this is what we are going to talk about throughout in the rest of the class. So, now you can understand one thing, if instead of going from the folded to the unfolded state, if you would go the other way around, what would happen? This delta G u and delta G f would remain the same, no problem, but what would change is instead of this minus f, what should we write? Minus u. Minus u. That is the only small change that would happen. Clear? So, if 
from left to right I am talking about phi unfolding, then from right to left I should be talking about phi folding. And what will happen in my phi unfolding would be that whatever wherever I have f it would be replaced by u. Okay, I will I'll come to that again later. But anyway, is this uh, diagram okay for you? At least to start with? Okay. Now, now let us actually talk about this phi unfolding, this phi value. See, if it is a ratio, if it is a ratio, typically what would we think? It would, it would lie between 0 to 1, right? We are talking about a ratio. Now, that is what it is essentially. So, then the two extreme cases are one is phi unfolding 0, the other one is phi unfolding 1. Right. So, let us look at those cases in a stepwise manner. So, suppose I have phi unfolding equal to 1. If I phi, if I, I have phi unfolding equal to 1, now from before which is the first slide, what was phi unfolding equal to? phi unfolding was equal to if you look at the second equation it was delta g hash minus delta g f right then what was the next one delta g u minus delta g f because i am going from the folded to the unfolded state u is my final f is my initial now, if phi unfolding is equal to 1, so if this is equal to 1, that means what can I write? If so, now phi unfolding is equal to 1 for me. So, I can write delta g u minus delta g f is equal to delta g hash minus delta g f, is not it? Very simple because phi unfolding is equal to 1. If that is the case, what am I left with? Delta g hash is equal to what? delta g u now try to understand the significance of this what are you saying what are you saying is if my phi unfolding equal to is equal to 1 then whatever change i have in the transition state is equal to the change in free energy of the unfolded state now that's what you would expect right phi unfolding is equal to 1 that's what it means to put it in words, what it means is whatever structure I am looking at, the protein is as unfolded in the transition state as it is in the unfolded state for both the wild type and the mutant. Do you understand this or not? That means there is a one is to one correspondence between what? The change in free energy of the unfolded state and then change in free energy of of the transition state for both the mutants. That means, this I do for the wild type and then I do it for the mutant. Is it clear? So, that means, I can say based on this, the T s which is the transition state is as unfolded as the unfolded state for both the wild type and the mutant proteins. Say that again, I did not understand. So, what we are saying is that the transition state is as unfolded as the unfolded state. So, let me write this unfolded state which is u for both the wild type and the mutant proteins. That means, whatever change in unfolding free energy you have in the unfolded state would be exactly reflected in the transition state. Is it clear? Okay. Good. Now, if this is the case, what is the other case? The other case would be phi unfolding equal to 0. 
if phi unfolding is equal to 0, what does it mean? If phi unfolding is equal to 0, then based on this equation, based on this equation, if phi unfolding is equal to 0, the numerator is 0, then I can write delta g hash minus delta g f is equal to 0 or delta g is equal to delta g f. Now, what is the difference between phi unfolding equal to 1? The phi unfolding equal to 1 says whatever change I have in the unfolded state gets absolutely reflected in the transition state. What does this one say? What this one says is these two are not related. That means if it is a two state situation, we are not talking about the unfolded state, then we are talking about which state? The folded state because it is a two state scenario, it is always a two state situation. So, then what we can write here is the transition state of the protein is as folded the transition state of the protein is as folded as it is in the native or folded state f for both the wild type and the mutant proteins okay tell me is the difference between these two clear to you if phi unfolding is equal to 0 then you can see immediately what happens is my delta g that is the change in transition state is equal to what the change of the folded state right so that now it is no longer related to the unfolded state because whatever change in the transition state you are having that is not getting reflected in the folded uh, in the unfolded state where is it getting reflected it is getting reflected in the folded state right and that's why this is clear where delta g hash is equal to delta g f okay so this is one way of looking at it that means when you when you're moving from the folded state to the unfolded state clear okay now because we are doing this let's do the other alternative that means let's talk about a folding scenario if you are talking about a folding scenario that means you are moving from the unfolded to the folded state then I will be talking about phi folding instead of unfolding as simple as that right. So, in this case my phi folding would be equal to what now tell me what should I write in the numerator delta g and I told you I am going from where from the unfolded to the folded. So, this should be hash minus u good f gets replaced by u you look at your previous equation that was for unfolding now you look at this equation that is for folding which you are going from the unfolded state. So, the energy barrier is in between what the unfolded state and the transition state delta delta g the initial it was u minus f this one would be f minus u good. So, if you write it again phi f would be equal to then delta g minus delta g u over delta g f minus delta g u right this is a folding scenario and if you take up any uh, paper nowadays people mostly talk about the phi folding okay. For a two state situation for a two state protein that means only denatured and the folded state or the native state phi f is equal to 1 minus phi unfolding this relation holds. So, phi f or phi folding is equal to 1 minus phi unfolding. So, it makes perfect sense you think about this if phi unfolding is equal to 0 where did you what did you find 
you found delta G hash was equal to delta G F and based on this equation what would 5 folding be? 1. If 5 folding is 1 what would you get? You would also get delta G hash is equal to delta G F is not it? And look at this. So, from this folding scenario what are the two cases? So, that means if 5 folding is equal to 1 if 5 folding is equal to 1 I will not do the math anymore if 5 folding is equal to 1 what would you get tell me from here the delta G u cancels out. So, what am I left with delta G hash would be equal to delta G f and this was equivalent to what phi unfolding equal to 0 that is what we found right. If phi folding is equal to 0 what would that imply from here delta G hash would be equal to delta G u good delta G hash would be equal to delta G u and this is something where we saw that phi unfolding is equal to 1 clear. So, these can be used interchangeably no problem at all provided to state absolutely and there are also certain cautions or assumptions you have to maintain when you do these mutations ok it is just straight it is just not straightforward when you do these mutations ok because you are changing a lot of parameters out there ok. So, let us look at these assumptions and then I will give you a practical example. What are the assumptions of the method? See mutation should not alter pathway of folding. Now, this is logical right. If I have a certain amino acid A 1 and I change it to A 2 and the way the protein was folding initially the pathway changes then we cannot compare anymore because now we are comparing two different pathways it is not a fair comparison right. So, one of the main assumptions is that this one is not changed. So, you can understand one thing this imposes a huge restriction the restriction is you just cannot change any amino acid arbitrarily with any other amino acid it has to be a logical choice I will tell you what those choices are ok. That means, the total energetic change would not be that huge otherwise there might be a drastic change in the protein folding pathway as such. Mutation does not significantly change the structure of the folded state right. Now, this is also logical if my folded state structure is fully changing then possibly I am comparing two different structures in the transition states then again that is not a fair comparison ok. Same mutation does not perturb the structure of the unfolded state too much ok. So, remember one thing unfolded state anyway does not have too much structures to start with not like the folded state as such, but this does not mean that if you are doing mutations it would not affect the free energy of the unfolded state it would it would. So, that is something you also have to keep in mind and last but not the least there are also some other ones, but we will not be talking about those. Those mutations should be avoided which add new functional groups to make extraneous interactions within the protein not found in the wild type that means, you cannot make a mutation because say suppose there was an amino acid to start with you replace that amino acid and the new amino acid say forms a salt bridge. So, there is a huge change the moment you have this extraneous interaction or say new hydrogen bonding coming in you cannot use this because then again you have to take care of all those interaction energies how would you do that transition state comparison has to be done with minimal structural change and minimum change in what the type of the folded structure and all those things. Also it should not introduce stereochemical uh, clashes or a totally a new stereochemical disposition otherwise it might destabilize the change of folded state on folded state to a huge extent. So, these are the assumptions right. So, now you can understand how hard it is to do a 5 L analysis because the simple thing is when you would pick out an amino acid that amino acid would be interacting with a lot many other amino acids depending upon which portion you pick out right and 
no matter how cautious you are, there would be certain difference in changes. That is why it is very hard for you to find a phi folding which is equal to 1. Why? Because intrinsically you would always be making some unwanted changes no matter how careful you have been. And this you are talking about a change which is at a very important part of the protein in terms of the stability of the protein. That is why it is very hard to find, very hard. But you will be finding high phi values, okay, which are phi, phi f which are close to 1. So, then what are the, so these changes are referred to as non-destructive deletions, a logical word because you are not trying to disrupt the structure or you are trying to keeping, you are trying to keep the disruption to the minimum. So, what are the changes? The first one you can go from isoleucine to valine to alanine to glycine, right. Even in this you would be seeing that there is a pretty much change in the size, but still if you talk about this delta G cavity and all these things, they can be taken care of and people have done that. The next one is leucine to alanine to, glynine, uh, to glycine, the third one is tyrine to serine, the fourth one is phenylalanine to alanine to glycine. So, if phenylalanine to alanine is actually a drastic change, but people still have been able to do that with a certain amount of confidence. Okay? Now, I would just ask you to focus on this mutation alanine to glycine. If you would ever you know look up these phi valent analysis or mutation analysis, then what people do is the people do something known as based on this alanine to sorry glycine scanning. See what does it mean? See it is not easy to do mutations in all proteins, but alanine to glycine is still a mild mutation. So, typically think about helices, where helices are pretty well packed, you cannot just change an amino acid arbitrarily, but if you are trying to find out if you are trying to find out to what extent that part is involved in the transition state or not, what you do is you take alanine and mutate it to glycine. That is what they say by an alanine to glycine scanning. That means you scan along the amino acid chain where you replace alanine by glycine and look at the corresponding changes in your phi values. Okay, this is something which has been routinely used, especially for proteins where it is very hard to do mutations. Now, since we are talking about non-destructive deletions, let, let us look at a disruptive deletion. So, you avoid phenylalanine to leucine because this brings about a huge change in stereochemistry. So, this is something you will have to avoid, okay, based on whatever assumptions we have taken. Right? So, just keep this in mind. I cannot go through a uh, lot of examples, but at least I will show you one or two so that I can uh, put forward the idea or make it a little more clear. Right. Now, you must be thinking about this. If we have been talking about phi f is equal to 0 and phi f is equal to 1, what about the values in between? There is a fractional phi values. Now, these are very difficult to interpret. Fractional phi values can be you know interpreted in many different ways example, they can arise if a protein folds by parallel pathways in which parts of the protein are native like in the transition state of one pathway, but unfolded in the transition state of another pathway. So, so remember, so now it is not, you are not talking about one pathway, you are talking about parallel pathways. When you are looking at, when you are doing this kinetics, you are looking at an average response. So, in one parallel pathway, it might be fully formed, in the other pathway, it might not be formed at all, but when you look at it, what do you look at? You look at an average of these two. That means you look at a fractional value which is in between. In other words, in other words, remember we talked about parallel pathways when we were uh, discussing protein folding funnels, right? So this many times, many or often times, people take this fractional phi value as an evidence of parallel pathway or existing in your protein folding or unfolding scenario. Okay. 
this is another case. If a side chain makes one set of interactions with one element of structure and another set with a different element and these elements react in different ways during unfolding. Okay. Now, I cannot give you examples of both of these, but at least I will try to uh, tell you something relevant to the first one. Okay, but just keep this in mind. Fractional phi values that is why are very difficult to interpret and they make the analysis a lot more complicated. So, that means you have to do a series of phi value changes, that means a series of mutations to figure out is it exactly a parallel pathway or is it just a one pathway I am having some other interactions coming in. For the protein discussion we started with which was chymotrypsin inhibitor 2, what they have found is by doing a series of mutations that it is not a parallel pathway, but it is essentially one pathway. Okay? So, that means just by doing one experiment of phi value, you cannot say whether it is a parallel pathway or a non parallel pathway, that is essentially what I am trying to say. Okay. So, look at a quick example of a fractional phi value. So, this is what it is. In chymotrypsin inhibitor 2, there is an isoleucine at a 39 position, which is a part of the helix and you are replacing it by valine. Right? So, this is located in the center of the alpha helix of chymotrypsin inhibitor 2. The side chain is in the center of the hydrophobic core and has many contacts with other side chains in the hydrophobic core. So, immediately you understand if you have to pick out a certain amino acid, which is very essential for the stability of the protein, you would be picking out an amino acid like this which has an important place in the structure of the amino acid in terms of the interactions it makes. Okay. Now, on doing this what it was found was there was a phi value of phi f of 0.5. See what does it mean? If you think about this phi f of 1, it meant was that the delta g hash was equal to delta g f. Right? Now, if it is 0 0.5, what does it mean? That means, whatever you have in the native state, half of it is being developed in the transition state. That is what 0 0.5 means. right? So, whatever you have in the native state, half of it is developed in the transition state. That means, there is a half resemblance, at least a 50 percent resemblance. Now, then how can we interpret this half? Now, think about this, how can you interpret this half? There are two ways you can do it. One is either the isoleucine side chain fully makes, could fully make or fully make some interactions, but have others completely unfound in the transition state. So, what does it mean? What it tells you is I have done this mutation, right. Now, say I have 100 protein molecules. In the 100 protein molecules, 50 of the molecules have already formed that isoleucine, that part in the transition state but 50 of the molecules have not reached the transition state even. But when I am looking at, what am I looking at? I am looking at an average. So, that means, when I take the average, 1 is 1, 1 is 0, I get what? 0 0.5. Okay. Now, what is the other interpretation? This is what you can also say. What you can say is, okay, I would not go by that. Instead, I would say is, all the interactions have developed but they have developed only to the extent of 50 percent as compared to the native state. That means, all of those have developed, but only at the level of 50 percent. Do you understand the difference? In one case, the first one what you had was 50 percent had fully developed, 50 percent no development of transition state. Now, in the second case, what you are saying is, see I can also have a phi value of 0 0.5 which is midway by having all of those developed, but not to the full extent of 1, but to the extent of midway which is 0 0.5. So, if you are doing only one mutation analysis, how would you figure this out? It is very hard because you already have two possibilities. right? So, then you will have to go on doing a series of mutations, but anyway the idea is not, but the idea is to try to uh, try to understand that having a phi value of 0 0.5 or having an intermediate phi value just complicates your data analysis. right? You have to do further experiments on that specific protein on that specific are doing some specific mutations. Okay. Okay, now, let us look at this. So, this is now I, will I was telling you I will show you a free energy example. I am asking you about phi folding that means I am going from the native state 
to the denatured state. Tell me what should the value of phi folding be in this case? Remember, if phi folding was equal to 1, what was the criterion? The delta G hash would be equal to what? The delta G f. Do you have it here? You do not have it, you see? This is essentially, what is this? This is essentially delta delta G, right? You see a change in the native state. Do you see a corresponding change here? There is absolutely no change. Instead, if you look at this here, if you look at this and if you look at this, these are very similar. That means, I can say in this case that my delta G hash is equal to delta G u, is not it? I can say delta G hash is equal to delta G u. Why? Because this change, whatever change you have here, this change not reflected in the transition state. So, that means, what should my what should be my phi f equal to? 0 or phi u is equal to 1. Clear? This is how your transition state would look in terms of the changes in free energy. So, then you, now you can realize if this is phi f is equal to 0, how would phi f equal to 1 look? Would it look like this? The same amount by which my native state is perturbed, my transition state is also perturbed by the same extent. See what does it mean? It means is, it means is if I am doing a mutation and if my native state is getting perturbed or by if my transition state is getting perturbed very similar to the native state, that means that portion, that portion is being formed in the transition state before going to the native state. I am repeating, suppose you have a certain portion of the structure say hydrophobic core formed in the native state, you know there is a native state. You do a mutation, you saw that the free energy change, there is a certain free energy change in the native state, there is exactly a similar free energy change in the transition state. So, what does it mean? That means, that hydrophobic core which was formed in the native state was actually being formed in the transition state, because both are being affected equally. Right? So, that is why we said remember when we were talking about this phi unfolding equal to 0 or phi folding equal to 1, what we said was it was as folded in the transition state as it was folded in the native state as folded that means to a similar extent. Now, if you try to rationalize phi unfolding or rather phi folding is equal to 0, what would you say? If it is phi folding equal to 0, what you would say is that which was the previous one. This native state, whatever difference you have, it is not reflected in the transition state. Then what would you say? What you would say is that whatever structure, uh, structural region I am looking at by mutation that is not formed in the transition state, but is found in the native state. That means, that portion in the transition state is still essentially as unstructured as what? The unfolded state. Guys, is it clear or not? I am trying to go at length, really slow to try to uh, you know emphasize how important this measurement is. It is not without flaws, let me tell you guys, it is not without flaws, but this is the closest thing you have. This is the closest thing you have to what? A single residual structural analysis and that is why it is so important in the field of protein folding, especially when you are trying to reason out why an amino acid is there or why did evolution actually try to figure out that sequence of amino acids in the hydrophobic core. That is always what a final goal is, try to reason out what evolution did. Clear? Okay. So, So, next day what I will do is if I will start now I will not be able to finish. The next day what I will start with, I will start with something known as
chevron plot chevron plot and a chevron plot you will realize why it is so called there is a v in the middle and if you would look at this if you would look at this slide if you would look at the slide i am looking at the slide again you will see on the left hand side of the slide on the left hand side of the slide there is a blue line on the right hand side is a red line these points are all experimental points you look at the concentration of the denaturant which is the concentration of guanidine hydrochloride which is the denaturant at the bottom so when guanidine hydrochloride is low your protein is in what folded state when the guanidine hydrochloride is high your protein is in what the unfolded state so now you can look at to the lower end of this which is this region to the lower end this should be reflecting what rate constant for folding because you are in the lower end of the denaturant if you go to the higher end of the denaturant what would it reflect the rate constant for the unfolding situation because your protein is already unfolded right and see what will happen is this is the beauty of the chevron plot remember when the protein is 50 percent unfolded that means when you are at your t m or c m rather let us talk about c m what happens to k equilibrium 1 okay now if you are talking about folding or unfolding does not matter say you are talking about unfolding right then what will k equilibrium be equal to 1 right that means the k u by k a for k by k u should essentially be equal to 1 that means they should be essentially comparable and see you can easily figure by doing a chevron plot when they intersect the point at the intersect means that k u and k f have the same value and that is what your c m this is how you can also figure out what my c m is and see whether it matches with your equilibrium studies ok. So, next class we will discuss this as uh, this at length and this would be the last in terms of uh, what should I say in terms of the fundamental aspect of you know of protein folding or how to look at or how to study protein folding because we have looked at thermodynamics this is the kinetic part and once we are done with chevron plot what we would do is we would actually start looking at different ways of doing experiments that means instrumentation how do we do a kinetic analysis that means cd the probe fluorescence and all these things that's the rest of the uh, course would be uh, focused on that okay